This is a very special part of Balmoral Golf Club, the corner where Fred Daly's achievements are laid out for all to see. Fred contributed enormously to this club, and in his unassuming down-to-earth way, he was happy to play with anyone and to pass on a few tips. And that was the attitude he brought with him when he agreed to take on the role of president of the Belfast Press Golf Society. Fred had learned his golf at Port Rush, where he was born and bred. And it was his mastery of Lynx courses that led him to greatness at Hoylake in 1947. 1947 and the Open returns to Hoylake after a gap of 11 years. One of the most popular venues on the Open Rota, the home fans would again be treated to a golfing spectacular. Only three Americans have come over to challenge this year. Johnny Buller, who first contested the Open in 1939. Vic Getze, a fine player on the US circuit and the amateur Frank Stranahan. Henry Cotton started this week as favourite. A 69 in round one was spoiled by a 78 on day two. Still, the Englishman who had last won the title 10 years earlier was one of four players sharing the 54-hole lead. A final day 76, however, would end Cotton's hopes of winning again. It was a final day of high drama. Stranahan proved the strongest of the American visitors to finish tied second. But it was the Irish powerhouse Fred Daly who would eventually triumph. Not the most stylish of players, Daly, who would win three British match play titles, performed well on the final day, recording a total of 293 to beat Stranahan and Reg Horn by a single shot. Daly finished in style. This, the winning putt. Fred Daly, the first player from Ireland to win the Open Championships Claret Jug. In 1947 at Hoylake, all Irish eyes were smiling. The year before, Sam Snead had won, but now the Claret Jug was back on this side of the Atlantic. Mr. Daly, you may or may not notice that, funnily enough, I put my green suit and tie on today. <laughs> I must say, this is a very happy day for me. It's a great honour for me to take this cup back to Ireland with me. It has never been over there before, and I hope the change of air will help it. <laughs> Fred went on to play in many other Opens and Ryder Cups as part of the Great Britain team. And he settled into life as professional at Balmoral, a role which our own Chris Moore reflected on in this 1990 obituary. It's his association with Balmoral Golf Club in Belfast that Fred is best remembered. As the club professional, Fred quickly made many friends. One of them was businessman John Fraser. He first began taking an interest in Fred's tournament career over 40 years ago. Travelled with him before he won the Open, around the different tournaments in north of England. And what, what was the effect of the winning of the Open Championship in 1947? Well, you couldn't find Fred in the crowds after that. He was very popular. And, uh, it was impossible if, and then it became that you couldn't walk the course with the golfers. I mean, you had to go behind the, the, the wire, but you weren't able to follow on the course. Winning golf's greatest prize in 1947 made Fred Daly Ireland's first truly international sports star. The Fred Daly room at Balmoral marks a career which saw the club's professional win 11 Ulster Open Championships, become the first Irishman to win the Irish Open Championship, as well as three PGA match play championships in England. One of his greatest victories came in the 1953 Ryder Cup. The Americans were regarded as the best in the world. Fred wasn't intimidated by their reputations, beating Ted Kroll 9 and 7 over 36 holes. One of Fred's teammates that year was a young Peter Alice, now of course a BBC commentator who's always had a very high regard for Fred Daly. Someone who brought a touch of lightness into the game of golf and um, that sort of spirit continues today, starting to creak a bit. We could do with a few more dailies around today, but uh, I shall treasure my friendship with him. Three years ago, Fred Daly went back to Royal Liverpool Golf Club on the 40th anniversary of his Open victory. 
Today, an Open champion receives in the region of £100,000 prize money and the title brings income of at least £1 million in the following year. But in 1947, Fred won just £250. Is that in the hole? Fred, when you won the Open way back in 1947, how much did you get for that? Well, I got the large sum of 250. What do you think about the prizes today? Well, I, I think it's terrific. But whenever you take the, the uh, expenses that these boys have today, I mean, it's colossal. I mean, in those days, you could have uh, went to a first class, well, a pretty good hotel for 10 bob, bed and breakfast. Now it is costing 650. Are you saying with inflation they're not that much better off? I wouldn't think so. I, I wouldn't really think so. Taking the expense today that these boys, take Eddie for instance, travelling all over the world. Eddie Pollen? Aye. Ah, my God. The expense must be colossal. Fred embraced an invitation to become president of the then Belfast Press Golf Society and accompanied the men from the press, as he termed the society, to many outings at home and abroad. For secretaries like Derek Henderson, this proved to be a real bonus in opening doors. Free. He was the founding uh, president of the society, first ever president of the society. And back in the day, the journalists uh, who met every Monday to play golf were always extended the courtesy of the course. In other words, when they came to places like Balmoral, um, the journalists didn't have to pay. Uh, because such was the, the, the weight that Fred carried and it was the same everywhere. Uh, every golf course we played that year or any of those years when Fred was president, including Royal Port Rush, which cost you now £200 plus, he paid for free. Fred loved the trips, uh, travelled everywhere with us, uh, down south, overseas. I mean, trips to Scotland, we went to Jersey one year. Uh, we played Lemoy, where Fred had played when he was uh, at his peak, uh, Royal Jersey, and they welcomed him back like a long lost hero. He was as popular, popular in Jersey as he was in Belfast. And um, he would uh, come out onto the course, uh, offer tips and advice, uh, shake his head in despair, uh, and would walk away. He was always there to receive us when we came into the clubhouse after the golf. He always sat at the top table and back in the day the host club captain was always invited to play with the, with the, with the media. And it was all a bit more formal than it is at the moment, jack and tie. Uh, all, not totally formal but f fairly f semi-formal and Fred liked it like that because even though he came from a very working class background, he's a guy who was, remember was brought up at Port Rush, Causeway Street in Port Rush, very working class background. He was a, a bit of a stickler for protocol and, uh, and could get quite angry um, if the journalist stepped out of line, uh, and occasionally we did. Uh, and uh, he would let us know very quickly what he thought, how he felt. In 1988, Trevor Kaki of board Fulcher, in what was perhaps the most inspired thought of his career, decided to invite the society to play Ballyliffin. Back then, it was a case of Ballyware, but it was to prove to be perhaps the most outstanding pairing in society history. And Fred was very keen to go, uh, and we were delighted to have him on board. But, as I said, the president of the club was a man called Noel Kilcooley, and about three weeks before we arrived or travelled, he called me and he said, Derek, just to be sure, he said, we're talking about the Fred Dilly is coming with you guys to, um, to uh, Ballyliff. And I said, yeah, and he's looking forward to it. And he'd be travelling with a man called Johnny Fraser, his lifetime pal, a very wealthy businessman from Belfast. Two weeks before we travelled, I got another call from Mr. Kulkuli. And he said, Derek, just to be sh absolutely sure about this, Fred Daly is definitely travelling to Ballyliffin. And I says, Noel, you needn't have any worries. I said, he's so looking forward to it. And um, hopefully the weather will be good and kind. We're going to be there for the best part of four days, because it was a weekend, bank holiday weekend. 
that was grand and he seemed to be fairly reassured and uh, I called him he called me a, a third time just the day before we were due to travel and he says Derek I'm sorry I'm really sorry to trouble you again he says but don't fucking believe me that Fred Dilly's coming this weekend so we're absolutely sure it's him isn't it and I says take it from me it's definitely him and the result when we arrived here with Uncle Fred there was nearly an entourage to meet us and greet us and how did that weekend go? well now if truth was told and we will not tell lies some lemonade was taken and people would say it was taken to excess and there would be vague memories of a very sociable weekend. This year Ballyliffin at last played host to the Irish Open and was visited by 90,000 people. For long-time Ballyliffin member John White Doherty, that Open couldn't have happened without the Belfast Press Golf Society. Well, in 1988, we would have been struggling quite a bit. In the early years, we struggled. We went to look for the run of 10 grand out of the bank. The only way they would give us 10 grand is to, if we put up 10 grand to match it. Mm -hmm. So we had to do it out. We hadn't the 10 grand to match. And the Belfast Press came along here. Brian Harkin, who must stay, looked after them very well in the Stanadale. He owed the Stanadale all the time. And we tried to look after them as best we could here. I think the big thing. Red Dilly coming here, along with us. And uh, he said to me, we're sitting looking out at the old club is wonder, and he said to me, he said, why haven't I discovered this place before now? He says, this is on the map as a nine hole course. And he says, this has the potential to be better than any valley for you. How right he was, it's turned that way. And then, actually, Fred, those quotes appeared in the newspaper. What, what effect did that have on the club? That was the effect that that had on the club as people came. I was involved here very much at the time. And I was taking bookings. There was no manager. We had done, we, I think we might have just got in an office here at the stage. And I'm taking bookings, doing the lot. And I got to the stage that I was nearly chased out of the place because there was too many people come, all from Belfast from Belfast and we owe and I mean we owe a lot to the Belfast Press and we should be looked after any time we come here that's my and would you say that ultimately the that it was a small thing but then Faldo came and and, and, yeah, then, well, and, Faldo, and, then, and then you had the open so Faldo so, actually rewrote what Derek Anderson and yourselves wrote but Derek Anderson you couldn't talk to him at all because he was just struggling down and he was quoting it and he was getting into the papers. And uh, like all the journalists were the same, John McGovern from Monaghan and uh, Ivan, all the whole, everybody was doing their turn. And uh, they would have, uh, people were just coming in and droves like that. Because there was all the writing and the Belfast Telegraph was one of the big ones, three times. I think it was John McVenny was doing that, and uh, they, we couldn't we couldn't get on all the people then. So this was 1988. Like. By '93, we were forced on to build a second goal. Characters that were in the press society. Did you, did, well, you did, did the people up here imagine? Oh, they're in the press. They must be stuck up, or they must. Yeah, be. Were you surprised at the well, characters that there were? Or? When they arrived there first, that would have been the impression. But by the end of the weekend. It was a different story. We knew everybody could let their hair down and enjoy themselves. And in fact, John McAvaney invited me to play in his captaincy in Royal Port Rush, which made me, it's one of the great memories, God me rest in peace. It's one of the great memories I do have of the Belfast Press. It's going there and probably, I'll not say, but there's a wee bar after nine holes. And we stopped there for a while. And Hit the ball very well in the back nine. <laughs> so we had a great, a great day there. Uh -huh. This is Stephen Watson. Congratulations.